Welcome to day one of our Pentecost retreat. There's like a, a buzz and an energy around this morning. It's so beautiful just to see so many different faces. And um, I was just thinking about how um, my sister-in-law uh, gave birth to a beautiful little girl last month. And um, in that lead up to the birth, there was this, this energy, this buzz that she had to go walking and dancing and all kinds of different things. Um, and I really feel like it's a similar kind of energy that we have happening here this morning that something is being brought to birth. Um, and so that's kind of like my prayer for, for this retreat that whatever it is in us that needs to be brought to birth, um, that we'd be open to the spirit doing that. And that's the thing is that we don't have to do the work. We just have to be receptive, responsive to the spirit who's already moving. So saying um we didn't originally intend to do this as an online retreat um we've been working towards something like this for a number of years in the sisters that we really we've all experienced the holy spirit in our lives but we want to deepen in that and we want to take people deeper in that so we were really hoping that um this year we'd be able to take a group of people away to a retreat center or something and as a community journey deeper into our relationship with the spirit um but as we have it we now have an online retreat and so it's beautiful it's a beautiful grace that instead of you know like 20 people which was our plan that god's bringing you know so many people from all around australia all around the world even and so it's something really beautiful that um even we have to be surrendered to the spirit and our plans aren't necessarily god's plans but we really want to maintain that sense of community over this time so that's I guess while it's such a small group heavy um, retreat because in those small groups when you're building those relationships when you're making it to those meetings that that's where the spirit's going to move that's it's it's not necessarily through words that we're going to speak but it's through listening to the spirit in those times of small groups that journeying together that praying together in community that we really want to have that kind of upper room experience and then when we get to Pentecost to go out from from that place of community journeying together. So when I was when I was uh, praying about this talk, I kind of had some different things together. But yesterday, um, I really felt like God had a word that he wanted to speak to us through this retreat um, and particularly for this morning. And that word is immersion. That as as Christians, our fundamental kind of point of our identity is in baptism. And, and baptism is just uh, comes from the transliteration of the Greek baptizo, which just means immersion. It's like one body fully immersed in a body of water. Um, so it's not like you're, you're sprinkling <laughs> or you're dipping in and out kind of thing. Baptism is the full immersion into the life of God, into the love of God. And we know that this, it, it's, it's a whole being, a whole life kind of thing. And we know this because there's another word in Greek for sprinkling, for that dabbling in and out. And that word is rentizo. So that means kind of, I guess, where we get rain from, that kind of like sprinkling kind of thing. And I was just thinking about how easy it can be, you know, like when the priest is going around and he does the sprinkling with water, how you get like one little drop and you're like, yeah, I got it. I got the whole thing. Um, baptism is, is when you actually get the whole thing. You actually get the whole thing. You're fully immersed in it. It's a whole life thing. So at the end of this, um, this retreat, we really want you to be totally immersed in the life that God wants for you, not just dabbling in it, not just moving in and out when you're wearing the right equipment or not just sprinkled a little bit, not just part of your life. We want a whole life immersion because that's what God wants for us. That's what we're saying yes to when we say yes to our baptism. We're saying yes to immersion. We're saying yes to a whole life, all of you. So I wanted to start with there's going to be a couple points through my talk this morning where I'm going to give you a phrase or something, and I just want you to reflect on it. Um, 
So maybe you'll write down whatever thoughts come to you. Maybe you just sit there with your candle or whatever it is that you've got with you and just, just soak in. So every, every reflection will just be another soaking in, going deeper and deeper into what is this thing that we're called to. So the first thing um, is just, just the phrase of Jesus, thy kingdom come. So when you hear that phrase, like kingdom come, what's going off inside you? What does that look like to you? What do you imagine it to be? Thy kingdom come. So I'll just give you a minute to just sit with that. So the reason that I wanted to start uh, with that phrase is because it's something that we're saying all the time, right? We're praying it every time we pray the Our Father. But really, this is what we're calling on, what we're really longing for in our lives. So Bernard said that um, I'm really passionate about the Holy Spirit and that I'm a student and both those things are true. So at the moment, I'm in the middle of writing 10,000 words on the Holy Spirit and his relationship with the individual believer and the individual believer in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's really cool. I'm getting to learn lots of cool stuff. So one of the things that I learned is that um, in some of the ancient manuscripts of Luke's gospel, in the part where the Our Father is recorded, instead of thy kingdom come, so where that appears in um, what we would know as the prayer, it actually says, May your Holy Spirit come upon us and purify us. May your Holy Spirit come upon us and purify us. That there seems to be a link between thy kingdom come and may your Holy Spirit come. That, in fact, we could say that for the kingdom of God to come is for us to be filled with the Spirit, for us to be purified with the Spirit. I'm going to talk about why that is actually the kingdom of God coming. when. The spirit is with us. It's why Jesus could say, as he's walking around, the kingdom of God is in your midst because he is carrying the spirit with him. He's been anointed by the spirit. He's carrying the spirit with him. That's why he could say the kingdom of God is in your midst because the Holy Spirit was already moving in the presence of Jesus. It's why um, St. Seraphim of Sarov could say the true aim of our Christian life consists of the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. The true aim of our Christian life consists of the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. That, that's, that's where we're heading. So why, why is that where we're heading? So this morning session, I've kind of broken into three segments, um, just so you know where we're going. So the first part is Pneumatology 101. So um, a little bit of the theology of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand why it's so important that we not only know about the Holy Spirit, but receive the Holy Spirit. Part two, what it means to be a Christian. And part three, how good are the first fruits? All right, so pneumatology 101. So we have the Trinity. We have the Father, who is the source of life. We have the Son, the only begotten. And then we have the Holy Spirit. One of the things we can say about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is proceeding. The Holy Spirit is the procession of God, proceeding from the Father and the Son. We have that in our creed. So one of the things that's really fascinating about the Holy Spirit, I don't know if you've noticed, but anytime there's a prayer to or a song about 
about the Holy Spirit is always like, come Holy Spirit or fall afresh on us or all these kinds of things. The reason that we can talk about the Holy Spirit, it's not so much a request as if he wasn't already coming. It's actually an affirmation of who he is because the Holy Spirit is the movement of God. The Holy Spirit is the procession of God out of himself to creation. We see it in the incarnation, that there would be no incarnation if the Holy Spirit didn't proceed out of God to touch Mary, creation, and to, with her, bring the word. So the Holy Spirit is the come of God, is the falling of God. It's actually an affirmation of who he is. So when God comes to us, we've got the Father, and through the Son, he, he sends the Spirit. So the Greek term for this is ecstasis, which is where we get ecstasy from. So the Holy Spirit, a lot of the ancients will talk about the Holy Spirit as the ecstasy of God, the one who goes out, the one who moves, proceeds. And the reason that the Holy Spirit proceeds out of God, comes to creation, is because it is only in the Spirit that we can then be in God. So we can, we can look at the Father, we can look at the Son from outside, but only the Spirit and the Spirit dwelling in our hearts, we then, in the return to God, in the Spirit, we move through the Son to the Father. Because God's not content with us just knowing him from outside. He wants us to know him as he knows himself. That's why he gives us the gift of himself, so that we would know him as he knows himself. And to do that, he has to give us himself. And the Holy Spirit is kind of the grounds where that can happen. And so we talk about this as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We know from Genesis and we hear it all the time that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Fundamentally, what that means is that we are made to receive God. Only, only other thing that can receive God in that way is God. But we're made in the image of likeness. Something in us is made capable of receiving the Holy Spirit so that he can take us up into God. It's just, it just blows my mind. The access point for the Holy Spirit into the world is always through individuals. We see it through Mary, we see it in the prophets. When God wants to move a people, he's always calling individuals. And through that individual, the Holy Spirit is touching the situation. And it's through our hearts. He's made us in the image and likeness. Through us, that's where God enters into the world. And that interaction happens in the Spirit. So... In scripture, we see lots of different kind of um, symbols used to explain something of what the spirit is like. So that coming of the spirit sometimes looks like breath. Breath tells us that it's an intimate coming. It's a life-giving coming. But breath is also something that's exchanged, right? In, in our lungs, it's where this exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen is happening. There's this exchange, an intimate exchange. That's how God is coming to us. We see the Holy Spirit coming as fire, this purifying force, this source of light and illumination that where the Spirit is, there's, there's light. And that's, I guess, why we can say there's freedom because you don't need to be afraid of anything when there is light. The Spirit comes as water, the life-sustaining but the thing about water is that we also have to choose to drink from it. We have to choose to engage with it. There's so many people walking through the world thirsting because they don't drink from the life-giving source. And that life-giving source is the spirit. If we want to bear life into the world, we have to choose to drink of the spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit comes as dove. It tells us God is living being. The Holy Spirit is a living being, not just uh, inanimate force. The Holy Spirit is a living being. So there's a guy, St. Simon Simeon, the new theologian, um, and he talks about, we know Jesus says, I am I'm the door, I'm the gate, all these kinds of things. He says the Holy Spirit is the key. 
Jesus is the door and what he opens to is the father's house. So what I want to propose to you is that we have been given the key in baptism, but we have to put the key into the door to enter into the father's house. I think there's countless Christians walking through the world holding the key to life and not unlocking the riches that it opens. So that's what we want to delve deeper into during this retreat is if we actually take that key, if we actually enter through Jesus into the Father's house, what will that look like? What will it look like when in the spirit we are living God's kingdom? So God's purpose is for us to receive his love, for us to know him from within, for us to be in the spirit so that we can communicate with God as God communicates with God. So we move to our next reflection question. So I'm going to give you a minute and I just want you to ponder that. So this is your phrase you're pondering. God made me capable of receiving him. That's what it means that we're made in God's image and likeness. He made me in his image and likeness capable of receiving him. So I'll give you a minute just to reflect on that and just to see what comes up for you. Okay, so God made us capable of receiving him. It's just amazing. All right, so now what we move into is, uh, is what it means to be a Christian. So um, anyone who has done any kind of uh, study, particularly a theology study, would know that um, Christ, the word Christ, it means anointed. So if we want to look at what it is to be Christian, we need to look at what it is for Christ to be Christ. So Jesus is the Christ because he is anointed. He is anointed with the Holy Spirit. So for Jesus, this unfolded historically. It happened in different stages over time. So at his incarnation, he was anointed with the spirit at his baptism he was anointed with the spirit in a new way through his ministry he had continual anointings of the spirit the transfiguration for example we see in his death and resurrection there's there's a relationship with the holy spirit that unfolds over time and so for us this anointing will also happen over time that we have baptism um, but that's not like the conclusive anointing. And the reason why is because the Holy Spirit is a person. 
So the Holy Spirit is inexhaustible. So we can always, 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 always go deeper into our immersion in the Holy Spirit. It's like, I don't know, being in the ocean, you can be immersed in the ocean, but you can always go deeper into the ocean. It's the same thing. The Holy Spirit is this inexhaustible person. Even people who are married would know that you're in a relationship with your husband or your wife and you know them and you're fully committed to them, but you can still always go deeper and deeper into who they are. So that's kind of what, it like, what it's like with the Holy Spirit. We see it in the life of Jesus and that's what it's meant to be in our lives as well. So we can, we can believe that Jesus is a good man. We can even be Catholic. But to be truly Christian is for us to partake in the anointing of Jesus. That's what it is to be Christian. To partake in the Christness of Jesus. To partake in the anointing of Jesus. So we enter into this firstly in baptism. And I was talking about that indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our little theology of the Holy Spirit. That Our initial entry into that is in baptism that in baptism we receive a couple of things we we receive a cleansing from from sin so that that would be the first effect that it's important because the holy spirit who is holy of course his presence is going to bring purification so we become holy through the holy spirit who is holy and this means that we have a new freedom we are no longer slaves to sin. You see it all through Paul's writings. There's a freedom that comes with being purified. So the next thing that happens is that we receive new life. And this new life has a couple of different dimensions. The first is that we become children of, of God. We, as, as Jesus is the son, we enter into his sonship and enter into that filial relationship that he has with the father. So we receive a new life by adoption. We also receive, um, as we start to become integrated into the life of Jesus, Jesus becomes the head and we become the body. So we become integrated into the body of Christ. Which means that everything that the head is, we are called to be in a way that's following. So that's what it is to be Christian, to look at the head and to integrate into that body of who he is. So I wanted to talk through a couple of things about what we know about who Jesus is as the head. We can just look at his life that I was talking about his ministry. He speaks with such authority. He speaks truth. He has authority over evil. He is always moving in signs and wonders and the coming of God's kingdom. For us to be Christian is to participate in this anointing of Jesus. The first thing is that means for us to receive that belovedness that is that is core to the anointing to be set apart to be have the hand of god upon you with love that is the spirit the spirit is love to i don't know if you've ever experienced someone who just knows so deeply that they're loved that they have almost like an annoying confidence <laughs> That's, that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about being so sure of the Father's love for us, so sure of his delight for us, that we really do have freedom. And then we talk about Jesus' ministry. So we're called to be anointed in the ministry of Jesus. And I think the easiest way for me to understand this is to look at his threefold ministry. So that of priest, prophet, and king. So the easiest way for me to understand these is to look at um, Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's three characters, Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn. So let's start with, with Frodo. So he's our priestly character. So in, in the life of the priest, if we look to Leviticus in the life of the priest, all the other, um, all the other tribes got their own land, but the priest, the priestly clan, they didn't get land. They had to trust in the providence of God. And there's something about that in, in the life of the priest. It's, it's a humility. 
a humility of knowing that you're called beyond yourself. So for Frodo, he knows that he's called beyond himself, that he is called to be the one to carry the weight and the burden as he goes to Mount Doom of the Ring. And a similar kind of thing is what we're called to. We're called to, it's where we're called to intercession. It's where we're called to all those offerings, all that thanksgiving that we offer in the Eucharist, that is to be our daily lives. To be worshipping and offering ourselves to God in everything that we do. So, like in my own life, I experience that. Um, every time I feel that like call to look at the world and see something that's happening and know that I'm actually not called to that, to know that I'm called to live within integrity within myself, um, that actually doesn't matter if other people are following or not, that knowing that I've been set apart to walk in integrity, to walk in love, to walk in justice in ways that other people might not necessarily follow. Every time I feel called into session, that's me living out that priestly ministry that is partaking in the priestly ministry of Jesus. So next one is our prophet. So this is Gandalf, if you're following the Lord of the Rings movement. And the prophet is the one who speaks truth. The prophet is the one who speaks light into darkness. The prophet is the one who counsels, who challenges. Um, and it it has a couple of different forms. So um, one of them is an actively seeking. Um, so an example of this in, in my life is um, I pastor care for a couple of people and sometimes I just sit and pray for them. And um, one day I was praying for one of my young people that I'm journeying with and I just had this image come into my mind for them. So I just drew it and I sent it in the mail to them that there was truth that God wanted to speak to them that they could receive because I was open to being a voice of truth. Even though it was really vulnerable to draw a picture and send it to someone in the mail, but there's something vulnerable about being a prophet. There's something vulnerable about speaking truth um, when you could easily stay silent. The, and, and that brings us to our next point. When there is untruth in the world, that's where we're called as prophets to speak truth, to speak challenge. And you see it in the Old Testament. All of the prophets are pretty much there because they need to speak truth of challenge. So it will always build up. It will always draw us into seeing God's kingdom truly. And then we move into um, Aragon, our kingly, our kingly ministry. And to be a king, we, we look at Jesus as, as the model, right? So he, he is humble. He is the servant. He speaks, as I was saying, he speaks over evil with an authority. That that's what we're called to do. We're called to take authority over our world, over our lives. We have that authority because we have, the, the king has a freedom. Um, the king is always working to bring about the kingdom to its potential. So that's what we're called to do in our lives. Um, I wanted to share a story about um, a time that I really experienced this in my life. So a couple years ago, um, we had a team of missionaries traveling around Australia um, for the year of youth. And I got to join for the South Australia part of the mission. And um, we're obviously missionaries, so we don't have lots of money or things like that. And so the team came down and they were telling me how They'd been getting, you know, plenty of fruit and vegetables and bread in all their different locations, but nowhere that they'd been had they found a meat provider. And I was talking about this with the Lord in prayer, and he just gave me like a certainty that because we were part of his kingdom and we were building his kingdom, that he was going to give us meat, that that was part of what he was offering to us. And so I... And, and this is, so then I took up my little priestly ministry and I went around the streets 
where we were living and I was just praying and praying and I kept walking past this butcher and um, God was just like, this is the butcher. So every time, every day I just walked past this butcher and I just thank God for the meat that they were going to give us. And so eventually I got to the point of going in and talking to the butcher and he's like, oh, this is kind of like a secondary store. You need to speak to our manager who's at the other store on the other side of town. So we went on the other side of town and we're talking to this guy, the manager, and um, kind of explained. It's really humbling to have to beg for food, but I kind of explained that that's what we were doing. And he just said straight out, it's like, that's a terrible idea. That is so bad for business. Why would I do that? Um, and so I kind of went away um, like, oh, okay, like I thought that that's what God was saying, but obviously not. Um, anyway, a couple of days later, he called us up saying that not even at his location across town, at the one two streets away from where we were living, we were going to get a big pile of meat every Friday. And like that's, that's the freedom that we called you. That's not meant to be an extraordinary kind of thing. That's meant to be just life in the spirit is knowing that we have authority to communicate with God on a daily basis, that God is the king of all things and that actually he can move any part of his kingdom for his own good. Um, so the, the ancient uh, writers, so the early Christian writers, would often talk about um, that you could be, be a believer in Jesus but you weren't a Christian until you were a bearer of the spirit. That, that really to participate in this anointing of Jesus is what it is to be Christian. And what we're moving in this week is looking at how much do I want to actually take that on in that immersive kind of way? How much do I really want to be Christian? How much do I really want to be part of the body moving under the anointing of the head? So your next reflection question is just, I am anointed priest, prophet, and king. I share in Jesus' anointing of being the beloved. All right, so our next section that we're moving to is how good are the first fruits? Um, so I was talking about uh, St. Simeon, the new theologian, and his little image of the key and the door and the father's house. So we've been given the key. We have it. So let's start using it. Let's start bringing the fruits of God's kingdom into here and that's really when we're talking about um baptism in the spirit we're really talking about using that key we're talking about 
being so immersed that the fruits of heaven can't help but break out into our lives here. So uh, part of my reading, I've, I've been reading this little book, Baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, by the International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services Doctrinal Commission, otherwise known as ICRIS. Um, and in, in this book, they talk about 12 kind of fruits of baptism in the spirit. So I kind of wanted to run through those so that we could get an idea of exactly what the kinds of things and how they all fit together. So the first one is, is a new awareness of the reality and presence of the triune God. So we can know lots of things about God, but this is an experiential knowledge of God that you start to know that God is father because you've experienced yourself as son or daughter. You start to know that God is father because you've experienced what it is to be loved by the father. You start to know that Jesus is savior because you've experienced saving. You start to know that the spirit is counselor, is friend, because you've experienced the friend. You've experienced the counselor. You've experienced the comfort, the love pouring out of the spirit. So point number two, power for conversion and holiness of life. The power for conversion and holiness of life. So as I was saying, when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit makes us holy. That's just part of the purifying presence of the Spirit. But this, this holiness leads us to conversion because obviously there's stuff in us that, that doesn't want that fullness. And so slowly, slowly, we're made into that temple of the Holy Spirit. Slowly, slowly, the gifts and fruits of the Spirit are poured into our lives to bring us into a state of conversion. So number three is, is worship. So worship starts to pour out of us in liturgy, in praise and worship, in the way that we live our lives. That having God living in us, we can't help but praise him. We can't help but worship him. We're so much more aware because we know him as he knows himself. So number four, uh, prayer, scripture and the sacraments. Prayer, scripture, the sacraments, we start to hunger for them. We start to find them a source of life in a new way. Number five, uh, we have a new love for Mary, the church, and the saints. That suddenly we're not just an individual off on our own little spiritual journey, but we are immersed into the heart and life of the faith. That it's community, God's family. And we really sense that, that sense of family. The saints are our aunties and uncles. Mary's our mother. Other members of the church are our brothers and sisters that, that we're not just about ourselves and what we can get out of it, but Eucharist becomes family dinner. Number six is, is the charism. So this is probably the one that people think about the most, but it's just one. It's just one part of life in the spirit. And so every charism um, is good and true and from God in as much as it's an expression of love. Every expression of a charism, and I want you to remember this for the whole week, every expression of any of the charisms is an expression of love, which means that it's for others. It's for others. It's an overflow of the divine life. And that the Holy Spirit is the one who searches. So the Holy Spirit kind of, search, when he comes into us, he searches the depths of us. And he searches the depths of God and he kind of finds meeting points where they meet and he distributes his gifts as he chooses. That is not about anything that we do other than just nurturing and nourishing what he has already given to us. So number seven is healing and deliverance. You will see this um, in any community trying to live a life in the spirit. There will be healings. There will be deliverance from evil. And this is part of our, our kingly anointing that we have authority over evil. We see it in the ministry of Jesus that healing was so important to his ministry because it was a sign that the kingdom was imminent. The kingdom was in the midst. 
And I know that we've already had words for healings that God wants to do during this week. And we'll start to hear them over the coming days. There will be healings this week because that is life in the spirit. So point number eight, there will be a renewal of vocations, particularly um, an empowerment of the laity. So that sense of knowing your identity in God starts to flow into a wholeness of life, that you have a sense of knowing who you are in the totality of your life and that you're empowered to respond to that identity in God. So a sense of renewal of vocations, so all, all vocations, particularly a movement of the laity. Uh, number nine, evangelization. So that fire that is put inside us, that is the Holy Spirit, it is the movement of God. The Holy Spirit is the movement of God. It moves us out. It cannot help but take us out that we are partaking in the mission of Jesus with the same spirit that Jesus was anointed with. So number 10 is a commitment to social justice, that movement to the poor, that movement to the margins. That, that's the Holy Spirit in us. In a similar way, that movement of community comes out in number 11, which is that there's an ecumenical impetus. So suddenly that sense of family isn't just, I'm not just Catholic, I'm actually united to all human people, but particularly other Christians, that suddenly you want to worship, you want to spend time with other Christians, you want to build that sense of unity and communion because it is the one spirit and that one spirit moves us towards each other in communion. And number 12 is that there will be new communities and in Disciples of Jesus, we definitely know that this is one of those fruits, that there'll be new places, new centres of commitment and that's really what the spirit wants to do. The spirit wants to help us to grow in commitment in ways that we humanly wouldn't want to. But he empowers us supernaturally to commit to lives of faith, live together. So your last reflection question is, God wants me to receive the first fruits of my inheritance from the father's house now. God wants me to receive the first fruits of my inheritance from the Father's house now. Now I'll just give you one minute. All right, so I'll just do a little forward recap of where we've been this morning. If you have nothing else written down, write down these four words because that's where God's really leading us in this morning session. So the first word's immersion, that he doesn't want us to just you know, have rain sprinkled on us. He wants us to be fully immersed in the life that he has for us and not just to be immersed but to keep going deeper in that immersion. The Holy Spirit indwells in us, that that is the grounds of our relationship with God. That is how we know God. And that is how we access the Father's house. That we are called as Christians to share in the anointing of Jesus. So anointed, that's the third word. And the fourth word is inheritance. We are called to have our inheritance and have the first fruits of it now that God has so many good gifts for us and he wants to pour it out through us into the world. So immersion, indwelling, anointed, inheritance. All right. So that concludes kind of like our first morning bit. So I'll hand back over to Berna. Um, my prayer is that this week, this retreat is really a time when something new will come to birth in your life through the spirit. Amen. <laughs>